Our next session, How Important Are Museums? Narrative and National Memory in War. We brought in one of our, our dearest uh, friends and advisors who knows uh, quite a, an exceptional amount about museums. Uh, Patrick Gallagher is the founder and president of Gallagher & Associates, a museum planning and exhibit design firm. For over 20 years now, Patrick has led designs on many museum exhibits, including the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles, the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv, and of course, the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. From 2000 to 2001, Patrick served as the president of the Society for Experimental Graphic Design and was named their 2012 Fellow, which is the highest professional honor for environmental graphic design. We're having uh, frequent, if not daily, meetings with Patrick and his team as we, we work to finish our design for the Liberation Pavilion set to open this next year. So seeing Patrick and having him on the screen is, is not uh, particularly new for me, but this is a different venue. So right now, Patrick, the session's yours. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today to really talk about the significance of <clears throat> museums as part of this narrative of the national memory of war. I've had the real honor to work with the National World War II Museum for over the last almost 15 years now and thinking about the immediate legacy and post-legacy of World War II, as well as working around the world on a variety of, of yeah. different scale Holocaust museums, which also deal in the important That's legacy of memory yeah. in World War II. And it makes me think as the living memory of the Second World War fades, the museum has become an increasingly significant medium to connect past and present. Similar to commemorative events and official memory politics, museums can reflect the cultural memory of current societies while also advancing and changing our knowledge of and interpretation of the past. At the National World War II Museum, we built the foundation of narrative through the oral histories of our soldiers who returned home and reflected on their memories of the events of World War II. Those living narratives will have been and will continue to be the voice for the institution. Those oral histories put the authentic character of voice into the story and will be an important part of the ongoing legacy of this institution. It's an important way for young people, and for that matter, all visitors, to engage in difficult content and difficult subject matter in a very real world and direct access. Other museums do it in different ways, and today we're going to hear from three very distinguished individuals uh, in how they approached it in their museums. Today we've got um, my partner at the National World War II Museum and, and one of my dear friends, um, Nick Mueller, who will talk about the evolution of what we did at the National World War II Museum. Dr. Brendan Nelson, who is the president with Boeing Australia in New Zealand and South Pacific and the director emeritus of the Australian War Memory. And Hilary Roberts, senior curator of photography at the Imperial War Museum. So each of them will give you a perspective on what they did in thinking about their institution, and then we'll open this up and, and talk a little bit more about um, successes and sometimes uh, continued challenges of keeping the legacy of World War II very relevant to our audiences and an important part of the lasting legacy of the institutions. So Hillary, why don't we start with you today and uh, you all right, you want to go last? Well, then, Nick, I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's got slides, and so she said before you came on. So, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there uh, and go first. Uh, let, let me just say, too, that uh, Patrick has been uh, helpful in imagineering uh, this, uh, not only this museum, but this program, this conference, and, and, uh, and this session, and uh, to get uh, people from three of the great uh, uh, museums on the Allied side is an idea that we had. In fact, uh, 2019, I uh, called, I was in uh, London, and Dialise, who's the uh, director of the uh, Period War Museum, was in Australia with uh, Brendan. And so we had a phone call at that time to 
see if we can hook all ourselves up. And here we are today, and, and Doc can't be with us, but Hillary is. So uh, uh, that's uh, how, how, how it all goes. So, uh, and how, it, how this uh, session began. But yes, uh, I think all of us would believe that uh, these national, these three national museums, and national museums in every country uh, very, are, are vitally important to uh, the curating and the preservation of, of national memory. And we're at a time in our uh, culture right now with, with real culture wars going on, as well as real wars. Um, and uh, we have our national memories uh, being contested by thought leaders, by boards, by politics. And, and uh, we have to consider, just like a historian does or a documentary maker, and certainly Patrick has to uh, also uh, consider, as he assists with uh, museum decisions, about what gets remembered and what gets left out. <laughs> and uh, th those are critical decisions in uh, presenting uh, the, uh, the national uh, memory. Why we fight, who does the fighting, uh, all the challenges of, of uh, storytelling and, and diversity and, and so forth. But uh, let me just say, uh, uh, to make a few comments about our differences, then I'll talk a little bit about our, our, our museum here. Uh, that was, uh, uh, well, first of all, we were founded as, as the National D-Day Museum some uh, 32 years ago in backyard with Stephen Ambrose. So we are not a government-sponsored, uh, 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 operating-sponsored uh, museum. I mean, uh, the Australian War Memorial and the Imperial War Museum both are, are government uh, funded. So we're a nonprofit, but we are designated by the United States Congress as the official uh, national museum for this country. Only difference is, is one I envy sometimes <laughs> because we have to generate all the funds to support our, our operations. So we have two different origins, but we have similar missions. And uh, this grew out of a small idea 32 years ago in Steve Ambrose's backyard. Uh, and, um, and I think um, he thought it might cost a million, and I told him he didn't know what he was talking about. It's going to be at least two, four million, and uh, 32 years later, we've lost Steve along the way, uh, but uh, we're now uh, a little over 400 million, and not counting the hotel. So it's been uh, there. We've been here from the dream to completion, and it's been quite an unlikely story. In fact, I'm writing a book on it right now in my emeritus status. Uh, but broadly speaking, as I said, all of us have the responsibility for preserving, uh, helping to preserve uh, national memory for our various publics. Uh, it's an enormous challenge, and uh, we have responsibility for how this story is told for future generations. Uh, and as museum leaders, we have to decide, as I said, what is important to remember and what's not. The conference title is very important because, as I just said, it, uh, the war and its memory are contested uh, on all sides of the political spectrum, and it's different from one nation uh, to another. Uh, World War II and its memory are being weaponized uh, almost every day. The war is raging, raging now in the Ukraine, and we are reliving or hearing again the echoes of the beginning of World War II in Europe uh, when Hitler attacked Poland. Uh, so today, outnumbered soldiers in the Ukraine are again fighting for their freedom and democracy, and the world is watching, uh, not helping, uh, but uh, not joining the war, but helping. Uh, so here we have a ruthless uh, dictator bombing innocent civilians and cities with the intent of destroying a sovereign nation based on the pretext and pseudo-claim of a neo-Nazi Jewish president <laughs> and uh, starting a war for Mother Russia as a defensive action. So. Uh, well, I think uh, they say, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but uh, sometimes it rhymes. And uh, I think that's what we have here. So, but we look, at, it's a, a good segue into our mission and narrative here, because uh, the National World War II Museum in New Orleans uh, is, uh, has a story that, uh, broadly speaking, is, uh, is a, looking at World War II as an existential struggle between totalitarian and democratic free nations of the world. Uh, we believe, I think most democracies do, that freedom is a, a very fragile thing, uh, that uh, it's always under pressure, 
democracy, likewise, human rights uh, have always been under pressure. So that brings us to my narrative here, and uh, as I say, the unfolding story in Ukraine is a is a, a good a good segue. I just want to offer three elements I think that shape the the narrative story uh, that we tell here. And uh, Patrick Gallagher has been at my elbow here for some 20 years uh, uh, as we've evolved into uh, uh, three, uh, four city blocks now and uh, about 400,000 square feet of exhibits in seven different uh, buildings and, uh, and ranked as one of the top uh, two or three uh, museum attractions in America. Um, our memories of the war evolve as, as our uh, societies do. But for our, our museum, uh, our narrative story is formed around, first of all, our mission. I think I need to uh, go over that. And then secondly, it's uh, focused, as you will see, on the American experience from the home front to the, uh, to the uh, war front. Uh, and I think experiential is a watchword here and, and the personal element that uh, Patrick uh, just mentioned. And the third uh, element is the meaning and legacy of World War II. There is a fourth, if we have time for it, or we'll just do it in, perhaps in the round table, Patrick, and that has to do with the technology and design and, and the impact of curating uh, and integrating the design and the decisions about how technology can assist us in telling the story. But first, uh, let me just uh, tell, discuss our mission uh, statement because it drives everything uh, that we, we do here. And it is to tell the story of the American experience and the war that changed the world, why it was fought, how it was won, and what it means today, so that all generations will understand the price of freedom and be inspired by what they learned. Well, uh, I think uh, that tips our hand uh, uh, in almost every respect. Uh, first of all, the American experience. Uh, we are not telling the war of even all of our allies, uh, much less the Axis powers, uh, except insofar as we engage uh, the Axis in battle and we talk about our allies at different theaters of the war. Why the war was fought is the road to war. It all is looked at as a journey through the war for our visitors. How it was won is the war itself. And what it means today is answering the question of, so what does it matter? What, what, why are we going to, to, how are we going to tell visitors uh, some 50 years from now uh, why it was so important to build uh, a national museum to World War II on, uh, four city blocks of, of New Orleans. Uh, the understanding part relates to our education mission and the inspiration uh, relating to the sacrifice and the gains of war. So we hope that we enhance America's public memory and uh, try to do so with honesty and integrity and as the best historical research uh, in, in the country and in the world, actually, internationally. And so. Uh, and we'd like to also bring things forward in our exhibits, our permanent exhibits and special exhibits that uh, surprise visitors, uh, things they never knew or even expected. There is a phrase in that mission statement, it's about the American experience in the war that changed the world. Now that tips our hand in another regard, and that is that uh, we are approaching the scalability of this story from the, our mission statement, that is quite an assumption, and it takes us a little out of just the, the geographic boundaries of, of our country. If it changed the world, then we have to understand that. We do that by the scale of some of our exhibits, the size of our, our museum, uh, and uh, it, we are, unlike some other museums, and perhaps Australia too, Brendan will talk about, we're not some people think of us as a shrine, but we're not designed as a, as a shrine or a memorial, uh, and, and that is another difference. But this uh, was for our country and for the world, all powers on both sides, a monumental global conflict by any, uh, the greatest conflict in human history in terms of almost every measure or standard, lives lost, uh, buildings destroyed, uh, uh, every theater of the war, from the Arctic Circle to the deserts of uh, 
North Africa and the islands of the Pacific and the Himalayas. I mean, uh, the atomic bomb, uh, the Holocaust, uh, the atrocities, uh, mountain fighting, just everything you can you can imagine. It's a monumental global conflict, and and I would uh, argue, and I think. Uh, uh, most of our audience, as well as our panel, would agree there hasn't been a conflict uh, that has to be portrayed by a society as significant as this one uh, going all the way back 2,500 years when a similar titanic struggle took place by the tiny Greek city-states uh, against the mighty Persian Empire. So it has that David and Goliath story there as well. Uh, and uh, when uh, Xerxes brought five million uh, uh, troops across the Hellespont to attack these old pesky Greek city-states that led to the birth of democracy. And Herodotus tells us that story using oral accounts uh, primarily as, as his source. 1066, the uh, Battle of Hastings and uh, the Norman conquest of uh, Great Britain, another one. But the scale and scope of the war are important, and uh, the perspective is an American one. Uh, and uh, so we begin chronologically and we tell the story of the uh, road to war uh, from the point of view of coming out of depression, isolationism. Uh, we were outnumbered at Pearl Harbor 20 to 1 by the uh, Axis powers, of, and they've been fighting several years in, in Germany and Europe and in Asia. And uh, we had to build a, a minuscule army of half a million to a 16 million man force uh, in in. in the immediate a few years of the beginning few years of the of the war. Uh, so we, we have a point of view, and, and I would say that uh, underlying everything that we do, I would say that that our point of view is that our, our allied victory, uh, especially here in our case, is that the American experience required the marshalling of every human, physical, financial, material, and spiritual resource that we could muster to defeat these two fascist empires across two different oceans. And it was also a transformative event in human history, certainly in the 20th century and for the centuries before and up to now. The second part of our approach is the war itself uh, and uh, that we call the road to victory. And you can see the road metaphor is always in there and it's uh, uh, chronological, and it's about America's uh, first being on our heels after Pearl Harbor, finally getting back into the fight and uh, turning things around in 44 uh, at the pivot point of, uh, of the fall of Rome, uh, but uh, D-Day, uh, Normandy, uh, and Saipan all within about three weeks of each other. But the, the story, the way we have developed this with uh, Patrick's uh, guidance and influence is uh, largely experiential and very uh, personal uh, in terms of the use of oral histories as we talk about how the war was won. And we use those narratives as the core. Stephen Ambrose had already collected. By the time we opened uh, 2000, some thousand uh, uh, personal accounts of just the event of D-Day. We now have about 12,000. Uh, so, uh, and we were also have a point of view too that uh, that while we don't believe war was good and we don't have any uh, uh, any uh, attachment to the idea of the good war, which was debated in another session here uh, just uh, uh, this morning, but we think that uh, FDR's uh, four freedoms and his vision for victory embedded in the Atlantic Charter. Uh, is uh, is what it inspired our troops, and uh, and it gave us an ideal not only for our values uh, should we enter the war, which we weren't at the time of his four freedom speech, the State of the Union in January of forty one. Uh, that those ideals uh, permeated our war aims uh, and and influenced uh, the, uh, the post war settlement. Uh, and, and, and FDR said in that speech that these values, these four freedoms of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear, were, were values uh, and aspirational values that were good not just for America, but for all nations of the world. 
And he embedded that. He forced Churchill to accept that as part of the Atlantic Charter, and that became part of our post-war uh, aim. So we'll talk about that just in a second. So in any event, we covered the battles and the campaigns and uh, contingencies uh, that go along and, and the diversity of our troops and the ironies. We look at the, the bad stuff, too. Uh, America made a lot of mistakes. Uh, uh, and we had setbacks on the battlefield in Kasserine Pass. We were fighting a racist regimes with a segregated army and the Japanese incarcerations at home and uh, all kinds of things that are covered here. So w there's no patina of a good war uh, in the way we tell the story. Uh, as I said, it was an existential war, but we think it's far better that the Allies uh, won, uh, and that our vision of victory as Allies uh, prevailed. And we think uh, there is some moral high ground there compared to the visions of victory for the Axis powers, uh, which uh, were lighting the world on fire, uh, and that resulted in the loss of some 70 million uh, people. So uh, the personal emphasis, I just want to Point to that again. We, we look at historical context with great, great history, great historians, but at the same time, uh, we have, as I said, uh, about 12,000 personal accounts, but we take the best of those that curated in, in the war in the Pacific or Europe or the home front or the arsenal of democracy, uh, the Freedom Pavilion, those are, in, those are about 40 or 5 or 50 of them for three or four minutes each uh, add to the uh, uh, to the story. Uh, and we look at the violence, the violence uh, from the air, uh, on on the ground, uh, in the water, the holocaust of the bomb, uh, and we try not to lose sight of the sacrifice of the civilian uh, losses and combatants. Uh, and we know that both sides of the war crossed every moral line uh, and uh, uh, and it began in the outset with the Germans bombing civilians in, in Warsaw and modern-day Gdansk uh, uh, in, in Poland. So uh, we were not the first to cross that boundary of uh, uh, bombing cities, uh, cities with civilians. Uh, and, but it had its own interior logic that finally led uh, to every kind of uh, destruction to bring the war to an end. And the third and last component, and I'll stop with that, is that the Liberation Pavilion now completing construction, and that has to do with the meaning and legacy of the war. And you won't be surprised that it goes back to uh, the uh, Four Freedoms again uh, and looking at, uh, at uh, the legacy and the meaning of the war and the takeaways that we be believe uh, we can uh, document historically and the Freedom House does so in New York. They've been tracking this ever since uh, the war. Uh, that is uh, freedom and democracy and human rights uh, were expanded uh, throughout the world, not everywhere and never perfectly. But since 45, uh, they were much more prevalent than uh, before World War II. Uh, when very few countries could claim freedom and democracy and certainly uh, human rights. And we asked people and the visitors a question, uh, was it worth the sacrifice? And then we asked uh, visitors at the end of this as to what would they do uh, for their own freedom uh, to, because the torch is being passed now uh, to new generations who have to deal with a very challenging world. Uh, so, there is a call to action in the end of our story, uh, and that will open in May of, of uh, 2023. So I think uh, maybe we could talk about exhibit design and technology, Patrick, later, but I think that concludes my remarks. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. I clearly um, motivated some questions that we can talk about after we get through all the presentations today because of uh, especially the the impact of contemporary relevance. It, I think that continues to be a, an ongoing challenge for all museums that are chronologically based stories. Um, next up, we'd like to hear from Dr. Brendan Nelson. Uh, Dr. Nelson is currently the president of Boeing, Australia, New Zealand, and South Pacific, and but he stands as director emeritus of the Australian War 
uh, memorial. And uh, he brings a completely different perspective to this conversation, which I think um, is part of what we wanted to do today was get um, based on locations, based on audience, based on the um, outcomes and uh, legacies of institutions. There is no one right way to tell this story. And I think it's interesting to really get into this discussion about how all three of you have taken such a different view of um, the memories of World War II. So, Brendan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And uh, it's a privilege uh, to be able to speak to you and to follow Nick and uh, to precede Hillary. And uh, I think, uh, Patrick, when you say that I bring a different perspective, I think that's probably your polite way of saying this is the guy that doesn't actually know what he's talking about. And in that context, uh, I, I would introduce myself. Uh, I'm a physician by training, as you heard, and uh, I led the Australian Medical Association in a, a younger life. And I spent 14 years in the Australian Parliament and served as Australia's Minister of Defence and leader of the main centre-right party. And, I spent three years in Brussels uh, as Australia's ambassador to NATO and the European Union and, uh, and I was thinking about what to do after that and I wanted to do something meaningful and I felt I had more public service left in me and I applied for the job as the director of the Australian War Memorial and when I went through the process uh, I was asked, I was challenged in fact, uh, you know, why would we appoint someone like you to run the Australian War Memorial? We've got a highly credentialed field of candidates that have run major cultural institutions and so on. And I said, well, look, I, I have no expertise, but I have had experience in leadership, uh, which, of course, is quite different from management. And the memorial, the Australian War Memorial, uh, has 300 uh, men and women who dedicate their lives to telling these stories who have forgotten more than I will ever know. Uh, and... Um, uh, and have immense expertise, but the key task is the exercise of um, intellectual rigour to the process of uh, exercising judgment uh, on behalf of the institution, and uh, I was very privileged uh, to be appointed. When I was appointed, I, I confided in one of my friends before it was announced, and he said to me, you're what? You're going to run the Australian War Memorial? He said, I can't believe it. He said, you're wasting your life. You've got far more important things to do for Australia, he said, than rearrange its history. And I said to him in part, in response, I said, well, if you can find something you love, which is important, and you can be paid for it, isn't that mission accomplished? And it actually has a lot more to do with our future than it does its past. And uh, in fact, 80 years ago this year, the American-born essayist and uh, poet, uh, the great T.S. Eliot, wrote that a people without history is not redeemed from time because history is a pattern of endless moments. And a sense of history is absolutely essential to any understanding of the future and attempts to shape the future. And when we live in a world where so much doesn't make much sense, history is the guiding discipline. And I've certainly found it has amongst other things, the capacity to challenge prejudice and also to inspire and give us the courage to go to the future that wrapped in our inner hearts we, we know we need. The Australian War Memorial is quite different uh, from uh, the World War II Museum in New Orleans and also different from, as you'll hear soon from Hillary, from the Imperial War Museum in London. The origins of the Australian War Memorial are the First World War and uh, the official First World War historian, uh, Charles Bean, who landed with Australians at Gallipoli, stayed with them at the front through the entire war, through to Mons and Quentin and the Armistice. At Pozier, France, in July and August 1916, he was witness to 23,000 Australian casualties in six weeks. And a dying Australian asked Bean, will they remember me in Australia? And from there, Bean resolved uh, that he would, at the end of the First World War, uh, build the finest memorial and museum to honour these men of the Australian Imperial Force and the nurses. And it was opened on Armistice Day, the 11th of November 1941, and of course a second, even greater cataclysm was in train. The mission, if you like, or the vision for the War Memorial in Australia was uh, articulated by Bean in 1948, obviously three years after the end of the Second World War. 
and it is to this vision to which we remain true. He said, here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves make. So in a world that Bean and his generation could not possibly imagine, our responsibility is to remain true to that vision, but to make sure we tell the stories in a way that is authentic and compelling to a new generation. And the mission for the Australian War Memorial is to give visitors uh, a sense uh, and understanding of the Australian experience of, of war. So the more Australian War Memorial and if you, our Second World War galleries, if you like, operate on uh, essentially four levels. One is the geopolitical. So why did the Second World War come about? What, was, what were the origins of it? Why were we fighting that war? Then secondly, the series of battles which are presented in chronological order. And they are battles, of course, on land, sea and air. And as Nick does uh, with the World War II Museum in New Orleans, also the impact that it was having on Australian society. And to give you a sense of this, the Second World War for Australia was quite different from the first. This was not about Australia's place in the world, emerging Australian identity, our vital interests were at stake. We were a population of seven million people. One million Australians mobilised. We sent half a million overseas and uh, 30,000 Australians were prisoners of war, uh, 8,000 died in captivity, largely at the hands of the Japanese. And we emerged from the war and, along with our allies, victorious, but inconsolably mourning 40,000 dead and we had 120,000 uh, uh, wounded. It was uh, an immense uh, contribution made by pretty much every Australian to the war effort. The third uh, level in which we operate is to tell the personal stories, the human stories. And then fourthly, the aftermath. So at the end of the Second World War, what did it mean for Australia? How did that change us? Uh, not just uh, how it changed us socially and industrially, but how did it change our view of the world and how we see our place in it? Coming back to Charles Bean, the founder of the memorial, he started after 1916 at Posier, he started collecting things, artefacts and relics uh, from the battlefields. And so for the Australian War Memorial, the exhibitions are entirely based on the collection. So everything from tiny little postcards and letters uh, right through to the bridge of a ship, uh, a plane, a tank and everything else in between. But it's not the objects and the artefacts themselves, it's the stories of the men and women that lie behind them. And uh, I know part of our challenge in this modern world is the appropriate use of technology. And one of the things that I would always be saying to our staff is you have to think like the normal person. You, you have to have the imaginative capacity to understand the world through the eyes of the everyday person that uh, comes to the memorial. So, as we know, there is an audience for knowing the calibre of a gun and uh, what it does and, and knowing a, a, a battlescape that this battalion went here and, and this division did that and so on and so forth. But normal people are engaged by the stories of the human beings, the everyday men and women, who volunteered, in our case, in Australia, to defend uh, everything that we hold dear. And so what we do is we, we use every single artefact and relic to draw out the story of a, a man or woman that is behind it. And they are, and, and one of the things that I realised, I brought the History Channel in in my first year at the memorial to try to get the Australian story to an international audience. And uh, uh, they sent the Scottish archaeologist uh, and historian uh, Neil Oliver and Neil said to me after after about six months of his fly on the wall stuff coming and going he said Brendan I've done a lot of these he said but this is the most emotional project I've ever done he said but there's something that's troubling me he said I I don't know if it's really about war and I said Neil you're going to think I'm weird I said I've only been here nine months myself but I've already decided it's not about war it's in a context of war but what this place is, is really stories of love and friendship, love for friends and between friends, love of family, love of our country, and honouring men and women who've largely devoted their lives not to themselves, 
but to us and their last moments to one another, uh, which is what he, he actually said in the last episode of uh, the series that went to, went to an international audience. The other thing that's important for our Australian war memorial, and Nick said this, uh, that this is one way where we differ, the building that we are in that was conceived and was the vision of Charles Bean uh, is a Byzantine-inspired um, Art Deco architecture which was built uh, in the late 1920s and the early 1930s through the Great Depression, through which we all suffered. And it has three principal functions. So it is a shrine. So at the heart of the memorial is the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier who was exhumed from uh, the Adelaide Cemetery in France and is buried at the heart of the Australian War Memorial. And a cloaking in cloisters, a pool of reflection in the centre of the memorial on, in bronze panels are the names of 102,800 Australian men and women who've given their lives for our country and our values in both war and in peacekeeping. And then we are a museum and we, we display artefacts and relics and do all of the things that you would expect to find in a museum. And we're also an archive. Uh, so those oral histories that are so richly important which of course are a part of our, of our exhibitions to which Patrick referred uh, earlier, uh, letters, diaries, maps, all, all of those things. So we combine those three functions and about 70% of our funding comes from the Australian government. Uh, the attitude in Australia, by the way, to that is as one visitor said to me on one occasion, he said, uh, if you excuse the language, but this is how Australians speak, he said, you tell the bloody government, we've already paid for this in blood. And that's the attitude of, of Australia and Australians to their national memorial. Uh, but of course, we also work very hard to, to raise additional funds. And uh, I can also say Boeing is a proud uh, supporter of the Australian War Memorial amongst, amongst others. Uh, the other thing um, that I found uh, before, just before I finish, um, in 2016, uh, I was troubled because in our Second World War galleries, there were only seven minor references to the Holocaust. So I said to the professional staff, I said, we need a permanent Holocaust exhibition. It probably won't surprise many people on the call that there was some resistance to that, uh, not from our professional staff, but believe it or not, from some of our volunteers and certainly from the broader public. Uh, one, one person said to me, uh, we were not lobbied, I was not lobbied by a single person to do it, uh, but I, in my heart of hearts, I felt it was the right thing to do. So there was quite a bit of resistance to it, and, uh, but in the end, we established a permanent Holocaust exhibition. And, of course, we, we explained the origins of the Holocaust and why it occurred, the meeting in Wansi, uh, the fact that uh, those, uh, when Reinhard Heydrich uh, chaired that meeting of the 13 German ministers and public servants, that, that nine of the 13 had the best university education Germany had to offer. Within a, a year of the meeting, of course, half of the six million Jews to be exterminated were dead. And uh, but we then uh, told the story of the Holocaust through those who came to Australia as immigrants, uh, from, particularly from Eastern Europe, uh, following the, the Second World War. But in, in defending and explaining what we were doing, uh, because one of the thematic criticisms uh, to me personally was, uh, it, it was said to me, you are breaching your charter. The Holocaust had nothing, I was told, to do with Australia. And I said to these people, I said, why on earth do you think we were fighting the war if we were not fighting against totalitarianism, Nazism, fascism, imperialist, militarist, uh, Japan in, the, in our part of the world? And it has everything to do with us because we are a part of humankind. We, in this day and age, are dealing with very embittered debates about the mass movement of people, the persecution of political, ethnic and religious minorities. We're living in a world where, where in fact, uh, anti-Semitism is, is rising and acts of violence against Jewish people, and of course not just them. And so it's absolutely essential that we uh, make sure that visitors understand the depths to which human beings can sink in certain circumstances. Another uh, thing, that, just to relate to you, and um, uh, the, the late 
in my opinion, great as Senator John McCain uh, came to the Australian War Memorial in late May 2017, and his one hour planned visit turned into two. His father, for those of you who don't know, was on the deck uh, of Missouri when the signature was taken in uh, 1945. And uh, so I took Senator McCain through the, the museum and, uh, and I said to him as we walked up to the tomb of an unknown Australian soldier, I said, now Senator McCain, you understand why when people come here, they know why Australia is an ally of the United States and we're not just good friends. I said to him, there's not a day goes by that this country does not remember and reflect upon the fact that 300,000 Americans were casualties in the Pacific from December 1941 to 1945. 103,000 dead, half those bodies never found, and a disproportionate number of them from those small, west, small Midwestern towns in the United States. We walked from the tomb as we had that conversation down past those bronze panels that I described. The names uh, in that case of 41,000 Australians who fought and died with the United States in Europe, in the Pacific, in Asia, in the Middle East. And I stood on the parapet of the memorial with Senator McCain and from there we looked down what's called Anzac Parade, straddled with memorials to the Vietnam, Korean Wars, our Navy, uh, to Brook and various battles across the lake to our parliament. And I said to him, in that building exercised on our behalf for our political, economic and religious freedoms. But here at the Australian War Memorial, we reveal our character. It's not possible to fully understand us as Australians until you come here. And it also is a reminder to our political class of the truths by which we live that are worth fighting to defend. The values that inform our national character. Fundamentally, they are courage, that spirit that challenges doubt in us, that imposes will, protects integrity, advances values and enables us to break through fear. Endurance, you never give up. Sacrifice, that a life of value is one spent in the service of other human beings, even at the cost of your own life. And then what we Australians call mateship, that, that spirit that binds us as human beings in the face of adversity no matter what. And I said, here we reveal these values because our values are our interests. And he turned to me and he said, yes, and our interests are our values. So the challenge uh, for uh, the Australian War Memorial and, and our, and I say our because I'm still very connected to it, our Second World War galleries, in my opinion, are tired. Some parts of them we have modernised. The memorial is going through a major redevelopment at the moment, uh, about 400 uh, million US, uh, to create more spaces to tell more stories and the modernisation of those galleries uh, will be a, a part of it. But the most important thing is, as I said earlier, for us to never lose sight of the individual stories that, um, that underwrite, uh, uh, underwrite the exhibitions. And uh, I realise I've, I've basically run out of time, but um, just to illustrate how it's done. So in one part of the Second World War galleries on a mannequin is a nurse's uniform. It was once white, it's now a, a pale shade of grey. And it has a small hole in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. It's a bullet hole. And that nurse's uniform belonged to an Australian nurse called Vivian Bullwinkle. She was one of 22 nurses massacred on Raji Beach, Banker Island, uh, on the 16th of February, 1942. She survived by feigning death in the blood-stained water, even though she was shot. She was subsequently captured and spent three and a half years as a prisoner of war and hid that uniform and testified at the war crimes trials at the end of the war. But Bullwinkle said on the morning of the 16th, they'd survived the sinking of the SS Viner Brook, uh, which had left Singapore. She said, we were on the beach caring for um, about 60 uh, soldiers and about 20 Japanese soldiers arrived and she described how with Bay and on they gestured for the men to walk along the to a bluff. And she said, one of the nurses, Matron Irene Drummond, said to the nurses, where there is life, there is hope. Around the bluff, the, the soldiers were bayoneted and shot. The Japanese soldiers returned. They set two machine guns up on the beach and gestured for the nurses to go into the water. And uh, Bullwinkle said that uh, Drummond, 
uh, helping the, another nurse, Florence Crossan, had a fractured femur, and another nurse to get to the water's edge. She said there was no hysteria, there was no screaming. She said they just called out the names of those whom they loved. And Bullwinkle, just before she and the other two were machine gunned, her last words were, chins up girls, I'm proud of you, I love you all. In life she'd offered them hope, in death she'd offered them love. And the reason I tell you that story, and we tell many stories like that, the reason is to encourage and remind people, and young people especially, to strive to be human beings that are selfless, caring and brave. And that the most fragile yet powerful of human emotions is hope, and the belief in a better world. So I'll leave it at that, and, and I'll be happy to take questions when we get to them, Patrick. Thank you. Brennan, thank you very much. That was a powerful presentation. Um, let's jump to our last presenter today, Hilary Roberts, who is a senior curator of photography at the Imperial War Museum. Um, it's as we're ongoing in our development at the National World War II Museum. And, and I know that um, the Australian War Memorial is going through its renovations and Hillary, your museum has just gone through a, a recent update. So it'll be interesting to hear your perspective of not just what you've gone through, but um, how that might have changed from your original perspective of interpretation. Thank you. It's. Um... An absolute pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for allowing me to contribute alongside um, some really august um, panelists. Um, today, I'm going to talk uh, from a curatorial perspective about how my museum has engaged in the Second World War. Now, the question of what a curator is and does is something that I'm asked uh, very often. And uh, my simplest explanation is that the curator, the, the curator's role is to act as a bridge, a bridge between the story, the history, the object that um, uh, an or the audience is trying to interact with. And like any good bridge, um, you know, uh, any curator needs a little bit of um, maintenance in, to make sure that um, they can continue to do their roles um, in the best way. So uh, the question of um, self-awareness is absolutely key to how a curator um, telling the story of the Second World War, or indeed any other story, does their job. Um, curator know thyself is um, a maxim which I think um, all of us in the field would um, agree is an element of what we do. We not only have to know the subject to know our audience, but we also need to know ourselves and what we bring to the subject and what we don't bring and how we can address any lack thereof. So I am going to be looking at the transition, if we can move to the next slide, please, from lived experience and memory to academic history and how that has impacted on my institution, its staff, and its engagement with the community. I should start by giving you a bit of introduction. Could we have the next one, please? So IWM was established in 1917. It was initially proposed as a memorial. Um, the War Cabinet uh, under Lloyd George um, uh, decided that it, its role was more effective as a museum. And it was then proposed as a national museum, a British national museum. But uh, within a few weeks of that going forward, uh, the trustees were very strongly reminded, and quite rightly so, that there were many countries, nations, peoples, who were fighting alongside Britain and for Britain in uh, this terrible conflict. And from that reminder stems our role today because we 
um, address the causes, the course, and the consequences of modern conflict from not a, not from a national perspective, although that is at the heart of what we do, but also from all aspects. From the we we need to be able to tell the story of all the people who are impacted uh, by these events. And in the case of the two world wars, of course, it is the entire world. So in 1917, when the museum uh, was in its early stages, the war was still very much in progress. The Battle of uh, Third Ypres on the Western Front, Passchendaele was uh, being fought. For its the first generation of curators, this war was a lived experience, a personal experience. Curators went to the battlefields, just like Charles Bean did, to collect items for the collections. The guns were still firing. Many fought. All experienced air raids, shortages, and loss. This was at the time seen as the war to end all wars. In 1917, it was inconceivable that another such war, let alone one on a greater scale and involving even more loss of life, could be allowed to occur. These experiences, these uh, concepts, as well as their professional curatorial expertise, informed their approach to the job. Every element of their work was informed by the desire to prevent another such war occurring by telling the story of what had happened and why. For the museum's audience, this was also a lived experience, which transitioned to memory in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, in many instances, the museum's audience at that time knew just as much, if not more, than the curators. The story the museum told was one based on shared memories and personal experience. The focus was on getting the details right, but there was a basis, a cushion of shared knowledge and understanding, which it was not necessary to explain in great detail. Um, for the first five few years of its existence, the museum had no permanent home. Um, the uh, the, the, the first generation of staff, which you see in the slide on the left, um, operated out of uh, the famous Crystal Palace, basically a glorified greenhouse, not the ideal environment for a, a museum collection, even if you have objects as robust as pieces of heavy artillery. So the plans and hopes to build a purpose-designed uh, building as indeed the Australian War Memorial was to do, founded on the rocks of post-war austerity and economic collapse. Britain emerged from the First World War as an impoverished nation. The idea that a building could be purpose-built was just not on the cards. In 1936, IWM achieved a permanent home in Bedlam which was a notorious Victorian asylum in South London um, uh, for those who suffered from mental illness. The museum had barely opened its doors there when the Second World War broke out in 1939. Next slide. And here again, the Second World War for the museum and its staff was a lived experience. On the left here, you have um, a uh, an extract from a fascinating document in IWM's archive, which talks about ev evacuating the museum's collections um, to safety. It gives a really clear overview of the curatorial decisions that um, the, the, the staff were faced with making at that point in time. Um, and uh, further down in the document, uh, the curator laments the fact, or rather 
um, with with regret, but um, with a stiff British upper lip, as uh, we all do. Up uh, um, the, the fact that um, many of our exhibits had to were requisitioned for war service. In other words, um, the armed forces came along, they took their pick of what we had in the galleries. They were re-employed on the battlefield, and we never got them back. And the other day, I was, um, I had a moment of déjà vu when I was looking at the latest news from Ukraine, and the defences in Kiev um, had hedgehog anti-tank defences, which had, uh, according to the labels on them, been um, taken direct from a museum exhibition in Kiev. You know, nothing changes in that respect. I will say that that hedgehog, uh, those hedgehogs in the streets of Kiev were very well cared for and very informatively labelled for any Russian tanks that happened to encounter them. Um, but IWM uh, was, as you will see, not a particularly high priority in terms of British museums overall. Um, other museums, the National uh, Gallery, the British Museum, the V&A, uh, the Science Museum, these were all the well-established uh, museums. IWM was the new kid on the block, and we were about war, and hey, tanks are built to design um, high explosive. Um, so we had some very difficult decisions to make at that time about how to evacuate the collections. And um, some of the collections could not be evacuated because they had to be employed for war service. And that includes my own area of expertise, which is the photographs collection. They needed to be used for, in the context of war, for war work. And so um, there's um, a very interesting story to be told about the way in which the IWM's photograph collections of the First World War survived the second. The museum was located in a very heavily bombed area of South London, both during the Blitz and during the V weapons campaign of 1944. A V-2 rocket detonated um, five minutes walk down the road and the building was steadily reduced to a semi-derelict shell. All the windows were blown out. It was exposed to the elements. Um, it took a direct hit. This is what the photograph shows on the right. And it was basically uninhabitable. The collections had to survive as best they were. The majority of curatorial staff departed, understandably and necessarily, for war work. Most never returned. Curatorially, this represented a catastrophic loss of pe professional expertise, which the museum struggled to re recover from in the years following the Second World War. And it was not until the late 1960s under Director Noble Franklin, Franklin that that loss was really addressed. The staff that remained were mostly women. Um, and men who were uh, not eligible for military service. They had to take on extra curatorial roles, learning on the job, often with minimal knowledge or experience of the collections that they were now responsible for. But despite all this, the museum's remit was uh, willingly extended to cover not just the First World War, but also the current conflict, meaning that in addition to essentially trying to survive, IWM was also trying to collect, and to collect on a scale which was beyond its experience to date. Next slide. So when the museum was able to reopen, having restored its windows, its roof, and retrieved um, those of its collections which were lodged in trustees' houses, etc. cetera. Um, it was still facing a challenge. Um, it still had a building which was not fit for purpose at a time of acute shortage of building materials and other resources. A director who had not been home 
throughout the war. He had slept every night of the Second World War in his office, and his laundry was regularly to be seen dry, uh, drying um, uh, on a line strung across his windows. Um, therefore, again, this war, the Second World War, was a lived experience for the curatorial staff who worked there for the next 20 years and most of its visitors. Shared memory and personal experience underpinned the vi uh, visitor experience. Now, I joined IWM in 1980 and was a member of the first generation of IWM curators to have no direct personal experience of global war or any war at all. I was immensely fortunate. My grandparents fought in both wars. My parents were children and grew up um, in the expectation that they would have to fight, but didn't. And I had been spared all of that, but I had seen how those experiences had shaped my, those two generations. I and those of my um, cohort, we had fistfuls of academic qualifications, but no personal experience of the wars themselves. For us, they were history, not memory. This was diametrically opposed to the museum's most senior staff, who had encyclopedic knowledge of the Second World War based on personal experience and memory. Um, with such contrasting perspectives on the job, it's hardly surprising that the museum's curatorial direction struggled for, co for coherence um, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, the veterans um, uh, nicknamed us the academics, we nicknamed them the veterans, and um, we had very different approaches and perspectives on the job. Nevertheless, we did learn an enormous amount from each other as the years went by. And the Falklands conflict in 1982, which was for me a lived experience and became a lasting personal memory. My generation went to the Falklands um, and fought um, in that conflict, was a crucial personal experience in helping the curatorial team bridge this gap of mutual under misunderstanding and understand the intersections between memory and history. For most of the 30 years that followed, um, the curatorial direction at IWM rested fairly comfortably on the curator curatorial team's ability to act as, or as I've already mentioned, an interpretive bridge between memory and history. Um, but, uh, and, and I have to say that for late 20th century conflicts, um, the Cold War era, the Falklands, and so on, right up to the present day, this is still a very important element of our approach. We are talking to people who've been there and done that, as well as people who haven't. But in other respects, the museum necessarily had to change. In order to remain relevant, it needed to acknowledge that Britain was changing. It was becoming a multicultural and much more inclusive society. And we also had to acknowledge that the two world wars were moving inexorably from memory to history. So over my career, IWM has refreshed its permanent displays dealing with the Second World War roughly every 10 years. And now I'd like to spend the rest of my time introducing our latest effort, which opened less than six months ago after nearly a decade in the making. Next slide, please. So in 2010, under uh, Dilease, um, we announced a major revamp to make IWM fit for purpose in the 21st century for a 21st century audience. Um, we had a, a situation where the audience we could tell, um, I mean, sort of in the, uh, within the last couple of years of making that announcement, we had lost all British surviving veterans of the First World War. 
and the second genera uh, second world war generation was all re also being depleted and also so were those who experienced at first hand the holocaust so we also had a changing audience a multicultural audience who thought through education media films culture literature research that everything that could possibly said be said about the two world wars had already been said and they knew it so how were we to engage with this audience who had had the benefit of uh, watching saving private ryan um uh, reading all these wonderfully researched textbooks and um, uh, sort of had studied the Second World War essentially from the age of seven up to the end of their education. We had to challenge that uh, assumption and also engage our visitors in such a way that um, this, uh, that they would uh, visit the show exhibition in preference to all the many other competing opportunities in London and elsewhere for their leisure time. We had to make these galleries relevant to people, to um, third generation British Africans, Asians, Europeans, and address uh, Britain's really complex colonial history and its tortured position at that time in Europe. So, um, next slide, please. The first World War galleries um, involved a dedicated curatorial team, extensive external consultation, a complete roots and branch review of collections and curatorial interpretations, and I hate this word, but it, it does the job, immersive visitor experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, it was followed immediately by work on the Second World War and Holocaust galleries. And these galleries had to work coherently with what we had done on the First World War. So we adopted a similar general approach to our World War II galleries, but one, built on our experience, two, utilized new innovations in the field, three worked on a larger scale, and four took a long, hard look about how we address the story of the Holocaust within the war itself. Now, um, up until this point, um, there have, had been very few, if any, presentations of this story in which the Holocaust was not a separate element to the story rather than an integral part of the Second World War. We had had a major gallery dealing with the Holocaust um, for about 10, 10 years prior, plus prior to this. It was on another floor. Um, you know, people uh, had a choice as to whether they engaged with it or not. It was, in essence, a separate entity. And what we wanted to do was to make people, help people understand how the Holocaust was part of the story of the Second World War. It cannot be separated out. It informed much of that generation's experience in every way, shape or form. If you were um, in occupied France, you experienced the Holocaust. If you were in Germany, you experienced the Holocaust. If you were in Britain, you experienced the consequences of the Holocaust. So we wanted to bring the Holocaust within the overall story the of the Second World War. Uh, and, and we, we developed concept state um, sketches, which is what you see here. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. We did a root and branch uh, survey of the collections. We questioned all of the history and all of our assumptions, all of our interpretations. Next slide. We traveled worldwide. We visited every continent. Um, we uh, visited um, countries which in the past 
we perhaps had neglected, particularly in the Far East. China, we went to Japan, um, obviously the Americas. Next slide, please. We consulted not only with historians in the field, but also with students and schools to get a sense of how they understood and what they didn't understand. And from that, we learnt that a young people's understandings of what the Second World War was and what the Holocaust was, was astonishingly low and very skewed in accuracy. I mean, I think um, only about 60% really had an accurate understanding of what the term anti-Semitism meant. There were some very weird and wonderful um, uh, replies when we asked um, who was Adolf Hitler and uh, so on and so forth. So we conducted uh, knowledge surveys amongst our audience to establish what they knew so that we knew what we in turn had to address and how to address it. We sent our photographers and a video camera team um, all around Europe to film contemporary uh, sites of the Holocaust, but also to other uh, battlefield sites around the world, North Africa, um, the jungle, uh, jungles of Asia, um, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. And we worked with the people who really knew. So when it came to the Holocaust, we worked with um, Rabbi Nikki Liss and others who haven't, you know, for whom the Holocaust is ingrained in their life experience, who could tell us um, so much about the cultural significance of the objects. He, uh, the rabbi, obviously was not a trained curator. So we learnt from each other again. And as he, that quote says, I thought at each object it would only take a few minutes, but I soon learnt to think again and appreciate that every item has a story. Next slide. And then came installation. Um, and this is where life got really very interesting because um, we had the pandemic. We had never expected that we would have to outfit um, our new galleries in the middle of a global pandemic where um, only so many people could be allowed on site at any one time. All of us had to wear masks and um, Every so often, we all had to stop working down tools altogether because we were in lockdown. And this is the reason why our initial plans and hopes that the galleries would be delivered in 2019 were, in fact, delivered in 2021. Next slide. And in October, we had a very special opening, and um, we got a pat on the head from... Um, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, um, which was, you know, very, very welcome. Uh, next slide. And now I'm just going to flick through some views of the galleries, um, which just give you a sense oh, of the right. design, the presentation, and the tools that we employ. So this is part of our display, which yeah, tells okay. the story of the origins of um, the Second World War. Next slide. Hillary, this is, this is Patrick. As you were thinking through um, the development of this, this is probably now uh, your fourth major renovation or third or fourth major renovation. That I, I personally have lived in, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously collections are the core of what we build our storytelling on, but powerful storytelling today has to be so multifaceted. How is How yeah. has the impact of technology changed these new galleries for you? Well, um, if we can show an, another slide or two, um, I'll, I'll illustrate that. But um, what that's done is to improve visitor engagement. So what we discovered in our surveys was that visitors did not want to be passive I, I participants in um, the uh, what, in viewing what the let, exhibition. Uh, they wanted to... Be actively involved. So we invited them so we got, to conduct got, uh, exercises, 
uh, deal, um, address interactive displays, ask questions and find out what the answers were, and so on and so forth. Um, we also used large digital projections. Next slide. Um, uh, and next slide. There you go. So um, this experience um, gives you a sense as you go into the period which deals with air raids and the blitz for sound and vision um, and indeed sensation, what it's like to be um, uh, uh, under air attack. Next slide. So you had to take there, a multi you had to take a multifaceted approach then. With, well, I mean, it, uh, I would say it, it's almost like theatrical staging. And but also you needed to. Um, you could not explore that. Um, you could not assume a cushion of knowledge, because everybody came to it with a different level of understanding and background. Some were victims of war themselves and you know this was very difficult to embrace so uh, we had to um, essentially deal with it uh, at different layers of granularity uh, different levels of interpretation um, and if you just sort of look at a one or two more slides you'll just sort of see how we go on to the holocaust Nick, how is Nick, how has that impacted your um, kind of thinking about, especially in the current light of the next um, pavilion being finished, the technological aspect of this generation's interaction with content? Well, uh, you know, the the interactives are, are always important, but the, uh, the I think the, the focus are, are choices that we have to make in terms of how technology will be uh, employ, um, and I, I'd be interested in, in Hillary uh, mentioning that we uh, curators uh, and designers, Patrick, you too, uh, uh, and we have to think about that with regard to all of our pavilions. But Liberation Pavilion is what we're working on now. How do you? Uh, you have to make choices about what the technology is, enables you to do. And uh, so the, that's why I said all power to the curators and the designers. We've got historians here, but ultimately you've got to be able to tell us what works. And, uh, and so we have to make choices. And we're actually curating memory as, at the very moment that we are making uh, commitments to a certain kind of uh, technology and how it's going to be deployed and how it's going to be consumed or used by, by the visitors. I mean, our dog tag experience that, uh, Patrick, you helped us with, what, what a struggle we had with that before we found a, a solution as to how to do it, where, it, uh, where uh, an individual uh, carries a dog tag with a barcode that uh, illuminates a, a story that they, of a soldier, a sailor, airman, all the way through all the exhibits. They can uh, connect with that person's story uh, on, a, on a chronological basis. But Hillary, do, do you face those choices? Who, who makes those decisions? You, historians? Uh, who, who does it? Uh... Well, um, we, 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 we try and come to a combined decision. One of the areas where we, we really have to um, be careful is the interaction of technology with increasingly fragile uh, historical objects, so textiles, for mm -hmm. example. And so lighting and the emissions from screens um, are really, um, you know, it's something that has to be debated with great care. And so the technical specifications of digital projections have to be gone into in gr great depth with the manufacturers um, to make sure that they are suitable to display alongside the relevant objects. And, and Brandon, I just, I'm curious. I to to jump in. I'm going to have to jump in here because we want to okay. run this out to some broader questions. I know I, have, I, I could continue to ask, but we do have some questions from the audience. So let's jump back to Mike and see if we can get a hold of those. Hey, hey thanks, Patrick. The, the, the first one's on uh, on living history. You know, what role do living history exhibits and events play in your museums? And do you anticipate there'll be more or less of that in the future? Anyone want to jump in? Is the question living history uh, uh, meaning reenactment? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the... Yeah, that, 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 that could be, Nick. <laughs> Um, or you, 
I mean, like, uh, exactly. Yeah, with pe period, period uniforms. Um, we do uh, draw on this occasionally, um, usually in the context of special educational events. So um, uh, we do have explainers in the galleries, uh, but occasionally um, we mount special events which uh, feature people who reenact. Um, uh, but uh, I would say reenactors are not routinely employed on a day-to-day -day basis for us. Yeah. And then, neither, the, neither with us, yeah. <laughs> all right. The, the next question is about uh, first-person accounts, and we'll go to uh, Brendan and then Nick. You know, can we rely too much on first-person accounts? And what do you see as the pitfalls of uh, doing so? Uh, well, look, I, I can only say from our experience that first-person accounts have universally worked, uh, have been extraordinarily powerful. Uh, not all first-person accounts, and the, the skill is to have people like Hillary, who are skilled in, in the art of uh, knowing which ones work and which don't, uh, to, to bring forward. Uh, I, I found myself as a, as a non-professional in this sector uh, often uh, choosing some that uh, professional staff thought, well, why, why is that one important? Uh, uh, so again, if it, it's, you, you, you're thinking about these stories, the actual story, who's telling it, how it's told, how it uh, evokes emotion and creative uh, thinking uh, to understand uh, the story in, in the visitor. Uh, and how it relates to the object and artifact that's being displayed. Uh, by the way, on the living his history thing, uh, at the Australian War Memorial, we have we actually have professional actors uh, that, uh, and we seek uh, corporate support to put these on. They will run sessions. Uh, so a, a woman dresses as a, a First World War nurse, and and she's she's reading last letters, last letters home from those who were killed. Uh, we have another uh, actress who does uh, a woman who's uh, in bomber command, and she's a radio operator uh, back in Lincolnshire talking to uh, the crew on a Lancaster on a bombing raid. So there is a place for it, uh, but my very strong view is not for, shall I say, well-intentioned amateurs uh, trying to tell the stories. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Nick, did you want to uh, talk about yeah, the first person? Yeah, I, mean, I would just say the personal stories uh, form the backbone of... Uh, of this museum's evolution, going back to Stephen Ambrose and the first thousand or so uh, that he collected for his book on D-Day that were uh, part of our collection now. And I would say that uh, that we curate those, uh, the ones that we use in our exhibits uh, very, very carefully, our, our, co our collection staff, our curators and historians, uh, we review everything. For example, we have been through probably 150 uh, uh, reviews of two or three minutes length, maybe four uh, minutes that that have already been screened by our collection staff for authenticity and accuracy, and and uh, as we know that uh, that that memories are not always uh, strong, and people uh, tell their story over and over again, and they pick up uh, other people's stories along the way sometimes, uh, but. Uh, but our people are pretty good at uh, historians, and they're very professional, and they they authenticate uh, everything. And you know, there, if there are a few uh, mistakes that are not consequential, we uh, we ignore them. If, uh, as Brendan says, if the the way in which the story is told, uh, the uh, the sharpness of their of their minds and their memory, uh, for the most part, if it's 80, 90 percent, uh, as we we believe authenticated and remember they're they're conveying not only their knowledge but their feelings uh and uh, it, they're very very powerful and we might have 45 or 50 uh, three or four minute or two minute uh, clips in each gallery those form part of that dog tag experience i was uh, uh, just talking about uh that connects you with uh, a, a an individual all the way either through the home front or through the campaign. So very, very important. And I would also say that our artifacts are chosen, just like Brendan mentioned, uh, that have a personal story, a, a bullet hole through a helmet that uh, happens, a, a web belt that was on a, 
18-year-old who writes with his head. He was a medic, and uh, his uh, Higgins boat blew up uh, on the way into Omaha Beach, and, and he writes his letter with the web belt that he donated. And I swam to France, but when I landed on Omaha Beach, uh, the, the, all the my first aid medical things in the five pouches were all soaked, so I went from one a dead soldier to another on the beach under fire to take off the one kit that he had on his web belt. And he said, I went through the whole war and every the face of every one of those five so dead soldiers uh, guided me. And so those kind of personal stories that come behind the artifacts to go along with the oral histories are really the power of this uh, museum, I think. No, that's Nick, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would punctuate kind of the answer to that question, just not as an answer, but the next generation, whoever asked it, you should take a peek at what the Shoah Foundation is doing with dimensions and testimony with Holocaust survivors today. It's pretty interesting. Patrick, yeah, can I just jump? Yeah, that, that's a great segue on, on the next question. Uh, in fact, we'll start, start with Hillary and then uh, Patrick, maybe go to you. You know, how do museums reach young people for whom World War II is such a distant event. And I know, Hillary, you started talking about the generational challenge you had when you started, and uh, certainly that goes on. And, and Patrick, mm -hmm. sounds like a segue from your last comment. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, on my perspective, personal stories have a role, but they have to uh, serve a, they have to be the right story for the point that you wish to make. Um, stories on their own, um, can just verge into nostalgia. Um, uh, in this context, you need to have a story mm -hmm. which illustrates the broader whole and vice versa. And that can engage young people um, and the average uh, person who comes to it with no knowledge. I mean, I was engaged in uh, conflict history through a personal story. And that led to an entire career. So personal stories have their place, um, and it certainly has a, its place in the, in the way of reaching young people. It helps make huge events comprehensible. But the key thing really is to um, talk to them and understand what it is they know, what they don't know, and uh, what interests them and try and help them through it. The idea that history is difficult, history is bunk, um, uh, is, and also sort of, you know, the kind of, I mean, I, watching um, young people go around galleries, they would head straight away for the touch screens and the technology. They engage with technology, um, uh, which is another draw. So the experience and, um, the attention grabbing fact and detail can help enormously engaging young people. That's great. Patrick? Yeah, I would also say something that reinforced what Hillary mentioned, and, and I know that Nick and his team think about it all the time, which is inquiry-based learning, asking questions, challenging them to think critically, gets them more deeply involved in the narrative and, and makes it more personal to them because it makes them think a great deal more about their own perspective on an idea, a challenge, or a topic. No, that's excellent. Brendan, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanted to say, look, firstly, uh, there's an immense enthusiasm for technology, and, and that's uh, understandable. But I, I, I often have to keep saying to people that technology is not an end unto itself. It's, it's a device which we use to draw out the stories. And one of the things that, uh, that we did in my time was that we had I mentioned those bronze panels with the names of our dead. Uh, what we did was we worked uh, with Google and we worked with our national broadcasters to have 10 and 11 year olds record the name and age of death of every one of them. And those recordings are now played. You hear these young voices just reciting those names and ages of death as you walk past uh, down those cloisters. But what the kids did was they actually researched uh, the story of the, and they were uh, basically asked to, to research the story of those people and they were given some oral histories. One of the 11 year olds, when I asked him what it meant to him, he said, I now know they were real people just like me and they weren't made up. So, so that's our experience, at least in Australia. Well, uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Patrick, and to our panelists, uh, Nick, Brendan, Hillary, you know, and to our audience. I know there's uh, 
a lot more questions in the queue, which is, is really encouraging about this topic and uh, you know your, your expertise. I'd like to just take a brief moment to thank our sponsors uh, for the Memory Wars Conference, the ABMC, the American Battle Monuments Commission, uh, EA, Respawn Entertainment, Oculus by Meta, and uh, for the folks, uh, you know, thank you to our presenters.